Okay, so um, welcome to uh, October Indo Ag Science Cafe. Um, this is Cherry Kubota, and I'm here with Carrie Mitchell, who is another organizer of this um, cafe. Um, and um, just quickly before going to um, today's uh, contents. So we are doing monthly basis, started in August, and then the purpose of this again is create a communication platform to talk about technologies and science behind the technologies. So initially, um, uh, academic um, uh, members uh, who started this uh, took turns to give some topical presentation. I did the first one, Eric Runkle from Michigan State did the second one. And then the, um, uh, we started thinking that, you know, we should probably have industry uh, speaker and Robert uh, Colangelo uh, from Green Sense Farm um, kindly um, volunteered himself as a, as a first industry member speaker for uh, today's meeting. So that's why uh, we have Robert uh, today. And then um, it's a short cycle for the next one, but October 30th um, uh, meeting, Carrie Mitchell uh, at Purdue University is going to give a um, topical presentation. And then I believe, Carrie, you are planning to talk about energy, correct? Yes, Carrie, en energy savings and controlled environment production, Cherry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, thank you, Carrie. And then we have one slot available this year, November 13th. If anyone is interested, I'd like to have your volunteer um, speaker status or, um, you know, suggestions welcome. So uh, let us know um, within a week or so, and we can have that person scheduled for that uh, November cafe. Otherwise, we come up with something else. We have tons of things, you know, research going on. So we have topics to share. Um, any questions for this? All right. So if you are not using your microphone, please mute so that it doesn't transmit noise. Thank you very much. And muting button is uh, left hand side, um, the microphone icon. Um, you should be able to do so. Um, so today, um, as I said, Robert Colangelo from Green Sense Farms um, uh, giving a presentation about growing the vertical farm industry and how industry and academia can work together. And this, this part is going to be recorded, but as soon as presentation is done, um, we will switch to non-recording mode so that you can ask any questions um, uh, without being uh, public. So um, with that, I'm stop sharing my screen. And then Robert, um, you can start sharing your screen. Does that work, Cherry? Yes. Great. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Colangelo. I'm founding farmer of Green Sense Farms. And I wanted to thank uh, Cherry, uh, Carrie, and Eric for their leadership in establishing the Science Cafe. Um, the indoor vertical farming market is at a nascent stage. And as it matures, we're going to need more collaboration between industry, academia, uh, uh, and, and, the, and government. And this forum really provides a great network uh, to share experience and exchange ideas. Um, a little background on myself, I'm a uh, hydrogeologist by training. Uh, my master's is in earth science, uh, my specialty is hydrogeology, and I've spent my career in the environmental field doing a wide range of projects. Um, I started out at Argonne National Laboratories as a researcher and I worked on a wide range of experiments from citing nuclear waste repositories to doing uh, acid rain research and looking at the impacts of coal-fired uh, power plants on vegetation. Um, I've been very lucky. I've uh, uh, worked in the environmental field my whole career, but have done lots of different things. Um, I've worked in uh, China, uh, Soviet Union, uh, Europe, and North America. And I've also been on the forefront of uh, four emerging markets. So I've started to see trends out there 
and all emerging markets exhibit similar trends and the indoor vertical farming market is, uh, uh, is very similar. Um, I've also started 10 organizations, uh, some for-profit that were not profitable and some not-for-profits that were. So every now and then I get it right. Um, but I can say that the indoor vertical farming industry is one of the most challenging uh, uh, startups I've ever had, but it's also the most rewarding. <laughs> Um, agriculture is going through explosive growth right now. Um, it's been somewhat stagnant for the last hundred years, but now with the influx of ag tech investing as a category and an asset class, you're seeing a tremendous amount of money and um, uh, technology and innovation going in agriculture. So I'm very excited to be part of this. And what I wanna share with you is my observations and uh, experience with indoor vertical farming and uh, how I think we can grow this industry together. Um, GreenSense Farms, uh, we started doing R&D in 2008, officially uh, set up the company in 2012, and we've had over 100 stories on us. Uh, probably one of the better ones was done by Thomson Reuters uh, on 9 billion bulls. It talks about a solution-oriented report on how we're gonna feed a population of 9 billion people in 2050. So I suggest if you haven't seen it, it's a very good piece with very good solutions, uh, a lot that are applicable to indoor vertical farming. Uh, our company is unique in that we generate revenues three ways. We build and operate farms in the US, we build and license our technology overseas, and then lastly, we do contract R&D. And uh, at our Portage farm, which was our first farm, we've converted it into a production scale R&D center. We've grown over 2 million plants and we've developed over 50 grow recipes. And we form strategic alliances with uh, key industry and academia partners. So this is a very exciting field to be in. And again, building this bridge between academia and industry, I think, is uh, very important. Um, I show this next slide as a relative comparison of farming capacities. It's very hard to get this data, but this is our best estimate of, uh, of the different capacities per different farming technologies. So if you look at butterhead lettuce grown in a field farm, it's typically spaced between six to eight inches apart. And if you get one harvest a year, you're gonna get somewhere around two heads per square foot. If you get two harvests, it'll be somewhere around four heads per square foot. In a uh, greenhouse, same butterhead lettuce, uh, you typically can get three to four heads per square foot, and you'll get somewhere between 10 to 13 harvests per year, getting about 30 to 40 heads per square foot. In an indoor vertical farm, using our numbers, we have 13 levels. We can get somewhere between four to six heads per square foot at 13 levels high and get somewhere between 20 to 26 harvests per year, which gives you uh, those okay. kinds of capacities in the right, thousand we'll head range. We'll, we can't turn on the fans until one of those is partially open. If someone's got their, uh, if they could mute their uh, microphone, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, so that gives you a relative comparison. I can, well, I'm, I'm not, right. Well, I'm, I'm at home right now, so I don't have the ability to. Let but me see I, if I right can. Right now is when the, the humidity's gonna drop really like significantly. So we just. Lie on somebody, mute this, thank you. So what I have found in my career is it's always important to follow the money. And if we look at the old environment agriculture food chain, what you see is that, uh, you know, the big fish eat the little fish. And the greenhouse almost imploded on itself. So I got some work to do. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking for his... Um... Yeah, just as long as one of them's like half over. Okay, I did. Sorry about that. Thank you. So when you look at the food chain for controlled environment agriculture, the good news is as consumers, we're all on the top. And what we found is that the chefs and the consumers really drive the market. Um, on a commercial standpoint, it's really grocery stores, produce companies, and restaurants 
that are the buyers of the produce and the greenhouses and the vertical farms sell to those grocery stores, produce companies and restaurants. The equipment manufacturers, material suppliers and consultants sell to the greenhouses and vertical farms. And academia, publications and associations support all those other groups. So when you look at the money flow, it flows up. And again, it's very important to understand the money flow because each of these groups has a different driver. So me as a vertical farmer, I really wanna get in a room with grocery store, produce company, and restaurant decision makers, because those are my customers. But oftentimes, I have to understand the mindset of the chef and the consumer, because I'm really selling to my, my customers, customers is the ultimate customer. So just understanding this layout and understanding that each of these entities has a different driver that drives their decision making is very important. So one of the problems I see in the industry is that there is so much R&D that needs to be done both on a systems level and on a cultivar level, but there's a real shortage of research of funds available for alternative agriculture. Most of the big dollars goes to big corn, big cattle, but very little is going to greenhouse and indoor vertical farms. And this is an emerging market, so it's really strapped for funds. There's very few companies that are profitable and they have excess funds to fund external research and development. And there's very little government and private sector funding directed to alternative agriculture. Uh, we don't have big companies like Monsanto and Syngenta that are funding large amounts of research. Uh, the US Department of Agriculture, as I said, much of their funds goes to big corn and cattle. So there's really a paucity of dollars out there. And again, why we have to come together in the industry to uh, find out how, where is the low hanging fruit of research that has commonality and where are the funding sources. So one of the big challenges for academia and the industry to work together is that there's cultural barriers and there's language differences. Uh, you know, academia talks in PPM and PAR and chemical equations, you know, industry talks in CAPEX, ROI and OPEX. Another challenge I see out there is that there is no standardized farm. Uh, you know, there's hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. Each of those farms are different. And even amongst farms that use the same growing technology, the farms could be designed very differently. So it's hard to find a commonality of research that could be extrapolated and applied to the industry. And then as a new industry, everybody is very concerned about their uh, intellectual property and, and uh, maintaining proprietary information. So those are some of the challenges we have as an industry. When I look at academia, you know, they have many strengths. You know, they're credible, you know, third party organizations. They follow a scientific approach. They oftentimes have extensive facilities and equipment. There's many different um, experts involved in it in a university so they can apply a multidisciplinary pr approach. They're experienced proposal writers and oftentimes uh, they're an inch wide and a mile deep. You know, they're, they're very specifically focused and have very deep knowledge. You know, the weakness I find when it comes to uh, combining academia and industry is that industry moves at a lightning speed and uh, academia is notoriously known for bureaucracies and slower response time. I found it um, increasingly more difficult uh, in engaging universities when it comes to contracts and intellectual property protection, uh, that sometimes that can be even a non-starter in working with universities. And I've also found that Universities have gotten incrementally more expensive as time goes on. Uh, at one time, they were a low cost way to do research, but when all the overhead gets uh, piled on, it becomes very expensive. Also, uh, you know, 
us as industry really needs production scale information and data where uh, academia is much better at that bench scale and that there tends to be a lack of commercial production experience which the industry sorely needs. And sometimes that uh, narrow, deep focus can also be a weakness when, we, when we're looking at you know, this larger picture. So um, I think these are some of the challenges that we have to overcome. When I share an industry perspective, you know, a lot of us would love to change the world, but we are constrained. We have to do it profitably. Uh, if we uh, don't keep an eye on the bottom line, we'll be out of business. So we're constantly balancing OPEX and CAPEX uh, uh, decisions. And our drive is to grow more quality biomass, just not more, it's gotta be high quality, and it has to be done quicker at a lower price. And so any money we put into our farms or R&D has to either lower the CAPEX, lower the OPEX, or lower both. And for those of you that don't know what OPEX and CAPEX is, I thought I would just give a quick overview. Uh, CAPEX is typically your capital expenditures. Uh, these are major physical goods or services that are gonna be used for more than one year. Uh, CAPEX is an accounting uh, capital markets term. To give you an example, that would be land, building and improvements, it's your growing equipment, it's your computers, automation controls and sensors. The other thing that this uh, becomes important to is that there's depreciation, which represents the amount of wear and tear on those fixed assets, and that can be done over a five or 10 year period. What complicates that a little in our industry is different pieces of equipment have different life expectancies. For example, if I look at our racking, and our towers versus our LED lights, we depreciate our lights over a five year period or maybe a seven year period where that racking may have a 10 or 15 year life. So these are some of the complications that you know, academia just may not be aware of. When I look at OPEX, uh, OPEX is operating expenses and these are the costs for a company to run its business on a daily basis. So that's your just common everyday costs, rents, utilities, salary, benefits, your inputs and packaging for growing, and then any R&D. Now, in our business, management's always looking to reduce those operating expenses, but we have to strike a fine balance. We don't wanna cut cost at the expense of dropping the quality of, of production or, or our plant output. So oftentimes you hear that the produce business is a pennies business. And what that means is that we make a few pennies on a large volumes of, of plants. So if you don't run your, your company efficiently, you're gonna go out of business. Uh, just a few pennies more on your inputs, a few more pennies on your rent or your utilities uh, can make that non-profitable. Um, lastly, I'm going to set Kerry Mitchell up. I think his uh, future talk will cover this. This is a sigmoid growth curve. And what uh, this shows you that there's uh, three major phases that a plant goes through during its growth cycle. The seedling, vegetative, and the flowering stage. And what we've seen is if you build your farm based on those different phases, and you design it to, de to precisely deliver the inputs per phase, you're gonna lower your OPEX and CAPEX cost. So the analogy I give is if you build a farm like a car wash, so that when your plant is a seedling, it needs a lot less light and energy and water and nutrient than it does when it's being transplanted or it goes into its uh, mature growth phase. Um, so if you can cut back to give it precisely what it needs, you'll lower both your OPEX cost in building the farm, operating the farm, and your CAPEX in building the farm. So again, our common goal is to get high quality biomass quicker. And the way to do that is by manipulating your LED lights, your temperature, your humidity, your CO2, your O2, your nutrient, your substrate, your watering 
your harvest, and then lastly, your post-harvest, which I think is an area that is very under-researched. Uh, there's very little information on post-harvest for indoor vertical farms. So again, these are, these are tremendous areas of collaboration that industry and academia can work together on because at the end of the day, it helps industry lower that OPEX and CAPEX cost. So another uh, area, we've just recently formed a partnership with Rufipa. Uh, they're a 25-year-old Spanish uh, greenhouse uh, uh, builder. They've built uh, greenhouses around the world. And again, if I look at that sigmoid growth curve, uh, combining an indoor vertical farm with a greenhouse is a tremendous energy savings. You know, using greenhouse, uh, indoor vertical farms to produce seedlings that then get immediately transplanted to the greenhouse to grow to maturity uh, will really uh, cut down on your operating costs. And so we see this as a whole nother area of, of R&D is combining, uh, how do you take these two growing technologies, marry them so you combine water, energy, uh, and, and other inputs. We've also formed a partnership with Ivy Tech Community College, recognizing that there's a shortage of workers in the industry. And academia does a wonderful job at training and producing four and uh, four year degrees and at advanced degrees. But right now, the industry really needs two year uh, degreed or non degreed professionals to work in agriculture. There's many entry level jobs that that really need people with good soft skills. So we teamed up with Ivy Tech Community College to create an earn to learn training center uh, where people get paid as they go to school and they learn about indoor vertical farming. And then uh, our, our guaranteed job interviews at a grocery store Martins, at Notre Dame Food Service, and at Four Winds Casino uh, in their food service department. Um, so as this worker shortage uh, proliferates, I think being able to do short courses and a one and two day hands-on training by industry experts is going to be needed uh, because we have such a uh, uh, strain both by the cannabis industry and just the growing vegetable industry that we really need practical hands-on workers. So uh, just in summary, what I see is that there's tremendous opportunities both on systems and on the horticulture side. And as we develop uh, those two areas, it creates uh, profitable opportunities and training to grow high margin crops, to look at botanicals that can be used in the biopharmaceutical industry, and also the cannabinoids and the industrial hemp. So I am very encouraged. I've never seen an industry with so much opportunity that's having such explosive growth. And as again, as a hydrogeologist, my number one concern is water conservation. And I think you're gonna see that uh, uh, be one of the issues of the decade. Uh, and without water, we're not gonna be able to grow and growing indoors really preserves um, water. So. My proposal is that India, uh, uh, academia and industry need to come together. We need a strategic focus to first, you know, identify uh, resources, create public-private partnerships, ships with industry, academia, uh, and government, and then identify our stakeholders, identify commonality of research, then we need to start identifying funding sources, prepare and submit proposals, work together to conduct bench scale and full production experiments, and then hold conferences and uh, publish results. So again, thank you for the time. Thank you, uh, Terry, Kerry, and Eric for taking the leadership and putting this summit together. But I think it's gonna take all of us to grow this industry and uh, uh, we have to find that commonality where we all benefit. I'm happy to answer any questions.